It's Friday night, it's almost live, and it's right up a big tower in London's Westminster. It's Sam Delaney's News Thing. Tonight, barging in here, stumbling about, and roaring their demands like they think they're the bollocks. It's Stephen K. Amos, Susie Boniface, and Matt Richardson. Coming up, up yours, Isis. There's a new silly bugger on the block. North Korea's back in town. Will America keep their nerve? Now's the time for strong world leadership. But what's this? Oh no, Obama shat his pants. David Hawk on the cuddlier side of ISIS. And our special guest, don't be fooled by the rocks that he got. He's still, he's still Lammy from the block. David Lammy, MP for Tottenham. Hello and welcome to Sam Delaney's News Thing. Thanks for joining me, panel. Uh, now, North Korea have got a hydrogen bomb. And in the words of their glorious leader, let's begin the year of 2016 with the thrilling sound of our first hydrogen bomb explosion, mate. Yep, he sounds like a bad Radio 1 DJ from the 80s, although obviously less sinister than that. <laughs> Last year, Kim's bum broke the internet. This year, Kim's bomb is going to do the same thing. <laughs> Kim Jong <laughs> claims to have built this massive bomb and they're so excited that they got the country's leading newsreader to announce it with what, to my mind, was a slightly inappropriate air of frivolity. Alright, calm down, love. It's not the X Factor. <laughs> and I tell you this, you are no Oli Murs. Kim Jong-un just wants to be taken seriously. Well, Kim, if it's really that important to you, stop dick swinging a weapon of mass destruction and maybe just stop being a Korean Augustus gloop with a girl's name and a Lego haircut. One thing I would say for your North Koreans, though, is at least they tested their nuclear weapons on their own turf. It's like the military equivalent of punching yourself in the nuts to make sure it works. The question is, has he really got this bomb? He reckons it's got the range to reach the west coast of America, but he could just be trying to shit out California. Then again, if scaring Californians was his intention, he'd be better off telling them he's made a bomb out of fucking gluten. <laughs> it's probably too soon to panic, but look, all I'd say is if Dennis Rodman suddenly fucks off to Canada for the weekend, then you might want to start <laughs> packing the car up. Uh, panel, does Kim Jong-un have a bomb or not? Matt Richardson. Uh... N no, like I think they've probably got a bomb, but I don't think it's a. I don't think it's an H bomb. I don't think they've got as much cash as they say they do. Mm. I think he's living a champagne bomb lifestyle on a lemonade bomb budget. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Susie, do you think that it's almost more scary though? Kim Jong Un is going around lying about having a bomb he doesn't have, like some sort of fantasist who says he's got a throwing star in his bedroom but hasn't really. No, it's highly amusing. He probably has got a hydrogen bomb, but it's really tiny. And more importantly, he doesn't have any missiles to put the bomb on. Right. So what he's done is create a hydrogen bomb he can only set off in his own backyard, which is a bit stupid. Yeah, quite right. It's really um, easy to calm Kim down, though, because he really loves cheese. He imports it from Switzerland by the truckload. So is that right? Send it, yeah, just need to what, send him a few what, truckles what, what, what or something Switzerland good. just go in, no, he ain't having any cheese no more until he gets rid of his bomb. It would work. They should try it. Well, Typical if fucking Swiss, by the way. If we know anything exactly. about them, <laughs> Stop sending they're the bloody down, appeasers. Man. Exactly, shut up. And I think perhaps even, you know, his army are very good at goose-stepping. Yeah. They all like to clap. Maybe that was the, the reverberations we all felt. Maybe it wasn't really a bomb at all. This is a man whose dad claims he'd never had a shit. <laughs> We've all got to remember the, the lies they say. His dad went, right, I've never shat because I'm incredible. And also, I did see a unicorn once. They were two real lies. Yeah. So him going, I've got a bomb, that's the most realistic thing they've ever said. He doesn't quite compare, does yeah. it? Just saying, I've got a hydrogen exactly. bomb. You might as well go, oh, instead of a penis, I've got a small man. Like, that is as believable. <laughs> <laughs> what about the poor North Koreans who <laughs> are all starving? <laughs> He's nicked all their money to build his bomb, pretend or otherwise, and they're all expensive to applaud this. It's a shame for them, isn't it? Well, yeah, they haven't even got enough tractors in North Korea to farm to provide enough food for the people. And a million people in their army reserves are actually school children. They're not really worth being scared of. I mean, scared for, and yeah. perhaps try and do something to help. But, you know, he's not going to harm very many people outside I'd be more his scared own of a country. toddler with a hydrogen bomb than Kim Jong-un, though, so, you know, maybe... Yeah. Stephen, is this China's problem? Because it's usually their responsibility to clear up mess like this in, their, in that part of the world, isn't it? 
Well, as we all know, everything's made in China, so they probably made the bomb in the first place. Yeah, <laughs> quite, quite. They're basically only mad at America, these Koreans. Shouldn't we just keep our heads down and leave them to it? No, I think because, like, when people are mad at America, you know when you hate someone, but their, like, girlfriend or boyfriend are all right? But they're sort of included in the hate anyway. It's like that with America. So people hate America. We're like their sort of wimpy boyfriend. And they go, oh, he's just a bit of a bellend as well. Yeah, so we're, we're as included as them. We're one of their underlings yeah. who stands around. Exactly. Yeah, OK, thanks, guys. Uh, well, 2016 is sizing up to be the scariest year since 2015. But we haven't got time to be scared of everything, have we? So let's work out what we should be bricking it about most of all with a quick game of what's worse. First up, atom bomb or hydrogen bomb? The scariness of the atom bomb is well established, but bomb experts have been quick to tell us this week that, if anything, the hydrogen bomb is even worse. In fact, it's well known that victims of atom bombs generally think, oh, well, could have been worse, at least it wasn't a hydrogen bomb, as their skin boils and their eyeballs burst down their cheeks. But what's worse, hydrogen or atom? Matt Richardson. Uh, hydrogen. OK, good stuff. Uh, number two, ISIS or North Korea? ISIS are like the maddest kid in the school, rampaging around the playground, punching everyone in the face and shouting, whereas North Korea is more like the quiet fat kid with no mates who's rumoured to own a set of nunchucks. But who is worse, ISIS or North Korea? Susie? Uh, ISIS, because they do actually come over here and cause problems, whereas Kim Jong tends to stay where he is. Yeah, and just lie about bombs, quite. Yeah. Um, lastly... Uh, an ISIS robot driver or Jeremy Clarkson. Both can drive a car, both got radical views that are deeply offensive, and both are prone to random acts of violence. But who is worse, Stephen K. Amos? Oh, oh um, I'm going to be... I'm going to uh, veer on the side of Susie here because... Um, um, uh, no, no, I'll go the other way. I, I think... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, think about, uh, Jeremy, Jeremy, Jeremy's actually only ever punched one person, so... We no, understand. he punched Piers Morgan as well. Or yeah, maybe you don't class yeah, him as a person. <laughs> yeah. Jeremy Clarkson punching P Piers Morgan is like ISIS attacking North Korea. Good it point, It just yeah. sorts out Cancel the problem each itself, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah. OK, so we're going Clarkson. I think Clarkson, yeah, he deserves it. You know OK, I mean? Clarkson, worse than ISIS. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Uh, now, David Hock is a self-professed investigative journalist, although on all the evidence I've seen, he's nothing but a complete prat. This week, he's taken it upon himself to rehabilitate a terrorist with what I suspect will be predictable results. David. Thank you, Sam. Most people get a dog for Christmas, but I got a refugee. A reformed terrorist, in fact, who's an incredibly nice chap. And we've come to the streets of Derby as our new splinter group, Nisis. Smile. The Huck Report. This is Emil. We're going around the town doing various bits and bobs. You know, we're, the, we're bringing the goodness back. Hang on. Wait a minute. Hello, sir. Come on, Emil. You, you all right? Yeah, a bit. Next the battery's gone. Emil, we're here, we're here to help. We're, uh, we're a new uh, splinter group. We're, we're nicest. You must have heard of all the troubles in the Middle East and, and so forth. And yeah. We're nicest. We're here to help. So this is a perfect opportunity. Uh, Emil, <laughs> what seems to be the problem? What can we... Um, do you recognise... Yeah, it's, a, it's like a tank. It's, it's like your tank. Lots, lots of wires. Yeah. Do you know how to fix I, it? It's just the battery, you see? Yeah, I think if you can give us I a know. push. Go on, then. All right, up then, you lazy bloody foreigners are all the same. <laughs> there we go. Moving now, I've started doing it, haven't I? Yeah. Huh? Yeah. You got a dog? You all right, you're all right dogs? Hello, sir. Hello, sorry to intrude. Uh, my name's David Hawk. We're doing a door-to-door -door service offering... Uh, this is Emil. He's uh, ex-jihadi. He's a reformed... Uh, uh, he's a refugee, basically. And we're offering door-to-door uh, -door services. Anything, any menial task, anything you need. Cleaning, car wash. Uh, you, I can hear a dog. Do you want Hello? us to take the, the dog, dog for a walk, maybe? We could take... Hello? 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 Dog. Oh, oh, let's get the dog. We can leave you with some paperwork so you know it's all above board and you're happy to take the dog, Emil. You will bring her by. Of course we will, yeah, that's absolutely fine. I'll leave you some details. We've got someone with us who you can sort all that out with. Yeah, perfectly happy to do it. OK. It's all above board. He's, he's, a, he's a nice fella. Three hogs from an Islamic terrorist, a reformed ex-refugee, ex ex-ISIS. I mean, he lives in my garage. 
I do chain him to the radiator merely only for security purposes. Uh, the radiator is not on, the radiator remains off. I wouldn't burn him and I certainly wouldn't be wasting unnecessary um, power for the garage. But he's warm enough and he's, he's oh look, there you go. Double. Some would say that was a threesome. There you go, three hugs. All right, let go. Let go. Good dog. Good dog. Good. Very, very strong. Yeah. And there you go, just to prove a good deed goes a hell of a long way. I'm David Hock, nicest to see you, to see you nicest. Back to you in the studio. The Hock Report. Well, I don't think any of us learn anything of any use from that. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't mind, but he's already put his invoice in as well. Um, OK, Barack Obama cried this week. All of us need to demand a Congress brave enough to stand up to the gun lobby's lies. All of us need to stand up and protect its citizens. OK, it was about a serious matter, but it's not what he was crying about we're interested in. It's that he cried at all. I mean, do we want to see a world leader crying? You wouldn't catch the Queen crying. She didn't even cry at Diana's funeral. And that must have been a stressful week for her, what with planning a murder and having to talk to Elton John. <laughs> Panel, how is him crying going to play on the international stage? Imagine you're Vladimir Putin sat at home watching that. What are you going to think? Um, I, I, I don't think it's a bad thing that he cried. I just think whenever a politician does anything in that context, it... Because those kind of speeches are so staged, that just, I think it makes that look really insincere and like it's part of a staged thing as well. He also cried at Aretha Franklin singing last a couple of weeks ago. It's, it's twice and, in a couple of weeks. Exactly, and that, I think, it looks better, because that's he's just crying at a song that, you know, me, obviously means something to him. But in that context, I thought it looked yeah, insincere. Yeah, but he's going through the male menopause. He's allowed to True. get a bit of And to be fair, like, our politicians that wouldn't cry at anything. The only reason Jeremy Corbyn would cry is if Jethro Tull, you know, didn't get back together. Like, <laughs> he's such a loser. <laughs> but this is why we have a problem with the younger generation. People mm. like you, Matt, yeah, right? So that man, I haven't finished talking, Matt. <laughs> that man there, he cried, right? He has shown Putin that he is he cares. Mm. He's gonna be he's gonna be the pri the president who goes down in history as the caring president. Not like the previous two, you know, a, a warmonger and a and a sex monster. This is the man who cares, right? And a, a few months ago, yeah, you, you're right, he cried at Aretha Franklin. <laughs> he also did a really great rendition of an Al Green song. So listen to that backstory. If he was on X Factor, I would vote for him. <laughs> I want to see people crying. Doesn't I would it... rather see him tweet a crying face emoji. That means more to me in my generation. <laughs> Susie, doesn't it display a fact that he may have a surplus of empathy, which is the last thing you need if you're a world leader making tough decisions? No, this is exactly what you want in a world leader. And in fact, it should be like an exam question that they all have to sit before they become a world leader. Simple yes or no question. Do you get an emotionally upset response if you consider the murder of 20 children aged six and seven? Yes or no? Anyone who answers no, obviously becomes Prime Minister. Of Won't the pressure be on him now? <laughs> Won't the pressure be on him to cry at loads of things, though? Because oh. I say, OK, you cried at that. Why aren't you crying about what's going on in Syria? Or why aren't you crying about this storm that or something like that? That may well be, Sam, but history has taught us that crying gets things done. How many of us <laughs> round this table have been to the supermarket and seen a toddler throwing a tantrum and crying, he gets chocolate in his face? Crying <laughs> gets things done. Actually, my, dad, my dad is 20 years older than um, um, Obama, right? I've never seen my dad cry. The only time I did see him cry was when West Ham United didn't make it into the FA Cup final. <laughs> When my mum told my dad that he wasn't our dad, not a shed of tears. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, guys. Uh, time for a break now, but we'll be back with friend of the show, David Lammy, very shortly, and Costa del Caliphate, how ISIS are selling their desert lair as the new Marbella. We'll leave you with these words from the UK's first astronaut, Tim Peake, up in the International Space Station. I hope I can bring the country together to celebrate Britain in space and our great tradition of scientific exploration. And before I sign off, I'm not sure that this has ever been said in space before, so I'll be the first. You made me look a right cunt.
before I sign off, I'm not sure that this has ever been said in space before, so I'll be the first. OK, welcome back. We talked about ISIS in the first part of the show. And what do you picture when you think of ISIS sort of HQ? Shit, probably, right? But you'd be wrong, according to a new brochure that came to light this week. Uh, here is our mock-up. The words inside are genuinely written by ISIS operative Jihadi Sid, uh, who took over from uh, Jihadi John and will soon be bombed, presumably, and replaced by someone like Jihadi Dave. Sid produced <laughs> this brochure designed to try and lure people from all over the world to come and live in the Islamic State. We pulled a few quotes from it, and to be honest, they do paint an attractive picture of what's going on out there. I, I've got to stress that although this is a mock-up, these really are genuine quotes from this genuine brochure. The Caliphate offers an exquisite Mediterranean climate that has all the makings of a plush holiday resort. Fruity cocktails, very popular in the summer and costing less than a dollar. If you thought London or New York was cosmopolitan, then wait until you step foot in the Islamic State because it screams diversity. All right, so that's what the screaming was. I thought it was just burning Christians. Uh, panel, how shit must Halifax and Bradford be if people are being lured from there to a terror state on the offer of a kinder surprise and a nice latte, Matt Richardson? To be fair, I think now, having seen that, I would rather go to the terror state than a Thompson all-inclusive holiday because <laughs> they are full of bellends, you know? Yeah. So maybe that's the appeal. You go, oh, it's a holiday that I don't have to pay for that isn't full of idiots. One thing that really sold it to me in that brochure was it said that you can get a fried egg sandwich in Raqqa, which is a way... That was the main thing that was stopping me joining the brutal totalitarian <laughs> fascist regime was the lack of fried eggs. Now he's said that it's there, I think I shall uh, sign up. But, but in all honesty, do, do we think that part of the appeal is a different life and you sort of think, yeah, the terror stuff and possibly having to blow myself up, I can kind of hope that that won't happen, but this is a nice sunny place and it turns out they've got loads of nice shit like we've got here anyway. I think, I think you're probably right. It's, it's the lure of a different life, but I'm pretty damn sure it's not that life. It's not about cocktails, uh, that suggests alcohol. It's not about uh, coffee, lattes. And, uh, and the, 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 the background of the author of this uh, report, I believe, was into bouncy castles. Mm. Is that right? Yeah, that's right, I mean, yeah. I mean, what the hell is that? There's no bouncy yeah. castle. How can you be so angry at the West when you're on a bouncy castle? It's a good <laughs> question. I've asked myself that many, many times. I mean, it's like, it's like, um, it's like you, we have that Disneyland, and what's this, the Holy Land? Oh, let's all go for it. Go on, get yeah. a ticket, go together. They've got to be careful though, haven't they? Because uh, they want to appeal to people who are going to actually commit to their thought system, their philosophy, their religion. But in fact, they keep going on about falafel and lattes and travelling the Middle East. I mean, it sounds They're like East London. Get hipsters. They're going to get hipsters. <laughs> and those people are pussies when it comes to Hollywood. If you wars. want hipsters, all you do is you paint this as somewhere like Thailand or Vietnam where you can go and discover yourself, you know, do some charity work, and you'll get everyone out of school on their gap year. Those balloons can blow themselves up, I don't mind. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what do we do about this? Do we expose it? Is it a PR war now, Susie? Do we expose it as You're just... You're going on holiday there. That's what we do. Yeah. Right? And if, if, if Britain en masse <laughs> turns up in Raqqa with our suitcases and demanding better Wi-Fi and everything else, they'll soon find that they want to um, reconvert back to Western ways or get rid of us entirely, one way or the other. But at least the argument would or be... Or just over. go on TripAdvisor and leave really bad reviews. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Wow. Well, and it'll be like, well, the loos don't work. <laughs> I tell you what, either way, I think we can all agree, on the basis of this, at least, it does sound like an appealing destination. Uh, certainly it's either that or Croatia for the Delaney's this May half term. And flights to Croatia are getting pricey. Uh, let's just quickly <laughs> look at what else this intriguing resort claims to offer. Ice cream, fluffy, velvety and sweet. If you want to treat yourself, then indulge in this full fat delight, all for less than 30 pence. Mm, less than 30 pence, reasonable. Chocolates, Snickers, Kit Kat, Bounty, Twix, Kinder Surprise, Cadbury's. Yes, yes, we have it all. Kinder Surprise, I like them. When we descend on the streets of London, Paris and Washington, the taste will be far bitterer. Because not only will we spill your blood, but we will demolish your statues. Erase your history 
and convert your children, who will then go on to champion our name and curse their forefathers. Mm, that's going to mark it down on TripAdvisor, though, really, isn't it? Uh, OK, oh, blimey, we got Tim Peake back on the line again, apparently. I'm not sure that this has ever been said in space before, so I'll be the first. Someone's touched my front bottom. <laughs> He's got space madness. Uh, OK, you might have noticed over Christmas, one of the most senior politicians in recent times was exposed as having done a horrible historical racism. Yes, Tory policy chief and MP for Dorset, Oliver Letwin, sent a memo to Margaret Thatcher in 1985 telling her why they shouldn't be investing money in black communities because, as he put it, they'd just waste it on drugs and discos and setting up Rastafarian craft shops. Fucking hell, Letwin. Where exactly did you get your info from? Uh, 1980s TV? Be careful giving money to these blacks, Margaret. They'll only go and spend it on lilt and pavements that light up when you step on them and... Body popping. Anyway, we invited <laughs> Oliver Letwin on to the show to explain his racist remarks, but he didn't even do us the courtesy of a response, which, as far as I'm concerned, gives us carte blanche to label him a racist dickhead and spend five to six minutes slagging him off. Joining us now to hopefully help me do so is David Lammy, Labour MP for Tottenham, who grew up on the very Broadwater Farm estate that Letwin was on about. Welcome, David. Hi. Uh, did you spend any state money on drugs and discos in the 80s? <laughs> No, it was my own money. Yeah, no. it was your money. <laughs> well, bravo for that. Um, no, look, Rastafarian... Craft shops. Craft shops. Yes. I've never, ever seen one. There's one on every high street. Uh, You're not looking that, properly. That is just <laughs> insane <laughs> in the brain. But, but what, what beggars belief is that this guy had a very serious job. This was a huge... I mean, the riots were just catastrophic for Tottenham. It was a terrible moment. You're charged with briefing the Prime Minister of the day and you come up with the biggest load of horse manure you can imagine. After the 1985 riots, there was virtually zero investment in Tottenham. Mm. Um, and you could argue that in some ways that built the kind of ground base for the second set of riots 25 years later. Mm. Um, other than a little bit of tightening up a Broadwater Farm estate, and I think we got a new library, I can recall nothing else that came into Tottenham. And Bernie Grant, the MP at the time, was demonised, absolutely vilified and demonised by the right-wing press, um, by the government at the time. He was called a, 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 a sort of spear-like chief. It was just absolutely terrible. And to be reminded of it um, uh, following the sort of 30-year rule, it, I just find it really depressing, actually. Oliver Letwin is still a chief policy advisor to the Prime Minister today. Yes, and I want to know what memos he's saying to the well, Prime Minister today. Why is he in post? Look, I suppose it was 30 years ago, but this was serious, serious prejudice. Mm. He said there was a... He, he demonised a whole community as a sort of... as morally bankrupt. All of us, including well, me, by the way. Well, he uh, said um, and there's something, you know, slightly Nietzschean about this, that it was something inherent there was a moral, inherent moral problem amongst black people. This is what he said. He said, lower class unemployed white people live for years in appalling slums without a breakdown of public order on anything like the present scale. He was suggesting that there was an inherent morality problem in black people. Absolutely. And what it, but but what, what it sort of belies is a kind of Downton Abbey, <laughs> aristocratic, superior sense that I'm on top and all these poor people should know their place. What happened was the first generation of black immigrants went out, they built the underground, they worked in the NHS, and their, their, their sons, basically, were really harassed around by the police, chronically failed by the education system. We got riots and all the rest of it. That's what really happened. And actually, the idea that, 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 that white folk in poor parts of the country were also not rioting, were also not upset, when the miners' strike was mm. going on at the same time, is absurd and patently untrue. And there's a whole history along, of, of lots of poor white community as virulent in their objections as some of the things that they were foisted on them as black communities wherever they are in the world. That's what oppressed people do, in fact. Have you spoken to or seen Oliver Letwin since this around Westminster? 
I have not seen Oliver Letwin, um, but I uh, look forward to seeing Oliver Letwin. Um, and um, I don't know, I think I might end up wrestling him to the ground. Yeah. <laughs> um, rugby tackling. Do, in the, in do, the you the lobby. do you think, I mean, you know, this is one of those things where you think everything that you thought about Tories might actually be true. You, you know, some of us will try to say, so can't, can't quite be the pantomime villas that, that they're made out to be. But then you hear something like this, you think, oh my God, all Tories are, to some extent or another, a bit racist, yes or no? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, <laughs> that's the loaded question. It's a cliche. What was, what was the, um, Alan Bastard, wasn't it? Was Alan Bastard, was, yeah. was the old... Um, was Rick Mayo. Rick Mayo was the real kind of epitome of the worst kind of Tory in the 80s. This memo confirmed that. And the idea that Oliver, if generally people see as a bit of a wet, mm. was actually that extreme in his views, is worrying about... I mean, what was Norman Tebbit saying, for example? <laughs> <laughs> um, David Cameron should sack him, right? Right now, he should sack him. It's 30 years ago. I mean, he's a, he, he did apologise straight away. Um, it was a mealy mouth and the truth apology, is the wasn't views, it? He said some of the, the things the, the I view, said the were badly worded. Is which, that... Yeah, I mean, I've got it here. Look, I'll tell you what he said. Right, go on, uh, he me. said, I want to make clear that some parts of a private memo I wrote nearly... I mean, the fact that it's private is neither here nor there. To do with it. That I wrote it's nearly 30 years ago were both badly worded and wrong. I apologise unreservedly for any offence these comments have caused and wish to make clear that none was intended. One, it's not private, because it's been made public under yeah. the 30-year rule. Two, uh, it's not some, it's all. Mm. Um, and three, he was a paid advisor mm. giving the Prime Minister the most... I mean, it was horseshit, basically, what he said. Yeah. And I'm saying that publicly. That's what he said. He should go. Good man. Thanks very much for joining us, David. Thank Pleasure you. to have you here, as always. That's all we've got time for. Uh, thanks to Stephen K. Amos, Susie Boniface and Matt Richardson. But, of course, the fun doesn't have to stop here. You can tweet us at NewsThingRT or like us on Facebook. Or why don't you go outside and make some real friends? You've got a lovely personality. <laughs> go out and let it shine. Be lucky.